buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you, and I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met Jesus 
Christ, my living hope. We all sing it out. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the ray has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing it one more time. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. And a hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hey, Landmark family. Happy Sunday to you. Uh, we're so excited to uh, be worshiping with you and uh, so excited to welcome you home. My name is Dan Burgess and I'm the Connections Minister. You know, that's something that we say a lot when we're here for our in-person gatherings is uh, welcome home because we believe this is family time when we worship together. So this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to welcome you to your home which is a little different to say welcome to your own home. But, uh, but I am excited just to be able to worship with you guys. I long to be back in our in-person gathering, so just continue to be in prayer about that. Um, as I said, I'm the Connections Minister, so if you're new to Landmark, if this is your first time tuning in online, maybe you've been with us for an in-person worship or, or an event in the past, or, or maybe not, I would love to hear from you. Uh, you can email me at uh, Dan. D-A-N at landmark, one word, L-A-N-D-M-A-R-K dot church. Dan at landmark dot church. Would love to hear from you. If you're new, if you have questions about Landmark, obviously that's something that we normally do in person. And we have our Landmark 101 times. So we're working through that right now, but would love to hear from you, especially if you have questions about Landmark and the things that are going on here. We're excited to be able to give you some opportunities to celebrate and, and to, uh, to be connected to the Landmark family. So you'll hear more about that in the service today. And, and you may have already seen some things on social media and some email information that went out about what will be happening on our campus here Tuesday. So we're really excited about that. But again, welcome home. The sign right behind me on my wall. Welcome home. Uh, we do believe that you belong here. And uh, there's a place for you at Landmark. We'd love to have you. So again, just email me if you have questions about Landmark or anything at all. We've come to a time in our worship today where we want to uh, give you a chance uh, to... 
um, contribute, uh, to be a part of what's happening here, to do collectively what none of us could do alone. So now is the time where we will uh, have our offering. Uh, we have four different ways to give. We we'll make it pretty easy. It's pretty simple online um, and, and other ways. But the goal is the same, to lift the name of Jesus Christ above all names. So if you would pray with me over our offering and, and what we do collectively here as a church family. God, thank you so much for blessing us in so many ways. Uh, There are things that are uncertain about uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus, but there are things that are uncertain about this life all the time because this life is not all there is. We have hope of so much more. Thank you, God, for that. We love you. We need you. Thank you for rescuing us from ourselves, rescuing us from our sin. While we're here, there's work to be done, and that is why we give. So, God, just take this this love offering that we do together, collectively. Um, It's so much more than what any of us could do by ourselves. But God, we know that you will bless it and use it uh, for your kingdom and for your work. So thank you again so much, Father, for all that you continue to do through your spirit. Thank you for your son. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life. So, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you.
Good morning, Landmark. My name is Wes Colm, and I'm one of the youth ministers here. We are so thankful that you have joined us for worship at Landmark Online. We know that many of you are watching from places outside of the River Region, so we want to welcome each of you, and we are so thankful that you have joined us today. If you are new to Landmark, we want you to know that we exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus and to be a community of believers who show the love of Jesus to people experiencing life struggles. At any time during our online worship, you can submit an offering by going to our website at landmark.church. Also, if there is something we can pray about this morning, you can text that request to 334-721-4548. Or go to landmark.church slash prayer and submit it there. You can follow along with the sermon outline by clicking the sermon link in the comment section of whatever platform you are watching the live stream on. Or by using the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. Once you open the app, simply click more, then events, then search for Landmark. There you will find an outline of the sermon slides and places for you to take notes. We have included a children's Bible class video that all of our children can watch during the sermon. You can access that video by clicking the children's Bible class link in the comments section. The Landmark staff will be hosting a drive by and wave hi for our church family in the Landmark parking lot. We would love for you to come and make a loop around the church building, saying hi and grabbing a cup of Nancy's Italian Nice. We hope to see all of you and your family social distancing this Tuesday from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Check out your email for more details. Check us out on the web at landmark.church for more events and ministry information. And like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram to stay connected to the Landmark family throughout the week. This morning, our lead minister, Buddy Bell, will continue the teaching series, Pause. Thanks again for joining us online, and we pray that each of you has an amazing week. It's an honor for me to give uh, our thoughts for the Lord's Supper. And when I normally take the Lord's Supper, I, I try to meditate on how much God loves us and how crazy he is about each one of us. And just to even imagine him giving up his son to, to take our place that we may have hope. And a great illustration of the love that he has is how he treated the apostles. And the, I always think of the apostles being us as fumbling fools and making mistakes over and over and over. And even at the darkest time of Jesus period, uh, they fell asleep and were tired. And the one I love the most is Peter who always kept trying, but kept falling over himself over and over and over. And even at the end, denied Jesus and cussed and said, I don't even know who you're talking about. Don't even know the man. And I love the scene where Jesus <clears throat> was crucified and was put in a grave and he rose from the grave and he asked who he wanted to see. And he wanted to see the apostles and he wanted to see Peter. And I love the scene where the apostles went back to what they knew best. They went back fishing to their old trade. And they looked and there was a man fishing, uh, fixing them breakfast. And Peter recognized who it was and he said, Lord. And he ran and hugged Jesus. And Jesus didn't hang him over with a sermon or beat him up for all the times of denying him. He just fed him breakfast and took him where he was. And I think about... <clears throat> how much he loves us and cares for us and uh, longs for us to have a dependence on him and have a life of gratitude. In Ephesians, it talks about God's love and really talks about how wide and deep and long his love is for us. Although it's so big that it says the human mind can't even comprehend how much God loves us. And I love in John 15, where Jesus says, <clears throat> my command is this, to love each one of you love each other as I have loved you and to know this no greater love has no one than this that he lays his life down for a friend and I praise God today that Jesus is my friend and that he's your friend and through this all uncertainty of life and all the ups and downs that we have hope in his son and I thank God for the sacrifice of his body and the sacrifice of the blood in Romans, it says the blood makes us right in his sight. And if you would right now, let's think about Calvary and let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for never giving up on us. I thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And I thank you for the greatest gift of all, and that's your son, Jesus. I thank you for um, the sacrifice that he went through. I thank you for the unfailing love that you both have for us. I thank you, Lord, for the blood that cleanses us and makes us right with you. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper, help us to clear our mind and to realize how blessed we are and to know that we have a Savior that took our place and nail all our passions and desires to the cross that we may have hope. And our only hope is in your son, Jesus. And as we partake, I pray we'll do it in a manner well pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus, amen. When I I listened to a fascinating TED Talk the other day, and here was the title, Boredom Leads to Brilliance. Boredom Leads to Brilliance. You think, 
In the next 25 minutes, I ought to become extremely brilliant, if that's the truth. You know, I thought that was an interesting statement, something I'd never thought of before, and yet I think Jesus believed that. You, you see, we would think this is crazy. I, I've been spending a lot of time with my grandchildren lately, and, you know, the, the worst criticism of anything is, that's boring. Or, grandbuddy, we don't have anything to do. There's nothing to do. And, and the problem is, it's not just children saying that. Now as adults, I feel like I've got to fill my life with one exciting event after the other. I can never be bored. I've always got to have something to do. But Jesus knew that was dangerous. He didn't live that way. In fact, here's our theme verse for today, Luke chapter 5, verse 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Key word there, he withdrew. Ten times in the gospel, he withdrew. If anybody's time was pressed, it was Jesus. But he knew he needed to put life on pause. Often. And that's our theme today. Pause often. We come today to the end of our Paul series. And um, I want to close out by saying we need to pause often. Because here's what's happened to most of us. Most of us have had to pause by crisis. And my challenge today is as we pull out of this, we need to pause by choice. Now let me say one thing. Everybody has not had this pause. Some of you are frontline workers. Some of you even working at home. Your um, level of work has even increased. And, and I, I, I'm sorry uh, that, that you've not got to experience this pause like most of us. I, I would say to you honestly, the last three months are probably the slowest months of my life. And I've somewhat struggled with that. But again, I, I know some of you haven't had that kind of pause, but for most of us, we have. It's been thrust upon us, and we've had to learn to live with it, and hopefully we've learned the power of pause. You know, I had you write down a couple weeks ago some of the lessons you're learning that you want to carry with you when you get through with this, and one of them must be that we must build pause into our life. You see, because this is a surprise. It is a real surprise that boredom leads to creativity. Uh, that TED Talk, let me give you a, a couple of quotations from that. One positive, one negative. When you are bored, your brain gets busy. You see, your brain is always doing something. But when you're bored, it has a chance to do things it can't do otherwise. And then here's the point, the negative. We are less creative when never bored. You see, when your brain has freedom... It can begin to connect things. It can begin to dream. It can begin to put different analogies together like it doesn't do when you're focused. So hopefully we're learning that. And that's why people say that those growing up today are less creative than ever. And executives would say one of the number one things that they would like to find in hiring people for their company, number one quality in one survey is to find creative people today. You see, here's the problem, is that we're too busy to be bored. You see, boredom leads to creativity, and yet our culture doesn't make room for that. I, I know as a minister, often I might be studying for a lesson. Uh, not this week, but last week. I had studied and studied and studied, and I had pages of notes. I had great information, but I had no clue on how I'd put it together. So finally, one afternoon, I said, I've just got to get away from it. And so I, I put it to the side. I wouldn't let myself study it the rest of the afternoon, the rest of the evening, until I came back in the office the next morning. In between then and when I came back in the morning, some connections had been made in my brain, and I could just quickly have a flow and an outline that at least made sense to me. And I think that's what happens. But when I keep myself too busy, those things don't happen. You see, we can always fill our time with more and more. Our, our, our time is so full, it almost has become impossible to withdraw. Now, that didn't just start recently. 
you know, generations ago when uh, there wasn't electricity, obviously when the sun went down and before it came up, there was an immediate time for pause. And then we saw different technology from the beginning of the radio, people griped about that, to television and what that did to our homes, to the computer, and now we can combine it all on this little device, this phone, this iPhone. And what's happened in that is a lot of good things. But what it has done is it's taken away opportunities to actually be bored. Because I, I can be waiting in line, you know, at the grocery store and, and, and get on my phone and quickly go do something. I can be at a red light, unfortunately, and check my phone. I can, almost anything, there's always a reason for me to fill my time. Now, listen to this quotation. I think this is so fascinating. Technology destroys cracks in our day that jumpstart creativity. You see, it used to be there were moments in your day built in where nothing was going on, and your mind was free. And so now we believe I can read my Bible, write my notes, check my phone, look for messages, all at the same time, we say we multitask, but the problem is psychologists say that's almost impossible. That you don't ever really multitask. That every time you shift from one to the other, your brain has to make a chemical shift. So a psychologists would say there's no such thing as multitasking. It's just moving from one task to the other. And we're wearing our brains out doing this. Ten years ago, the average person sitting at work switch their attention every 10 minutes. Today, we switch our attention every 45 seconds. We check our email an average of 47 times a day. Most Americans grow up now will spend a, a full two years of their life on Facebook. Now again, there's nothing evil about any of those things, but all of that switching depletes chemicals, which actually depletes creativity. I don't have that time for my, my brain to dream and to, to wonder and, and connect. You see, we, we think we must be productive at every moment, and, and this almost gives me away. I know so many people who say the first thing they do in the morning is they check their phone. Last thing they do at the night before they go to bed is they check their phone. But what actually has happened is, is, is being this productive has not made us more productive. It's made us less productive. That's the truth. Now listen to this quotation. This is my favorite quotation out of the TED Talk I listened to. The only people who refer to their customers as users are drug dealers and technologists. That's, that's pretty strong. Users. Why? Because the people who run... Facebook and the people who run Instagram and the people who run Netflix and all those things. They have thousands of technologists who are, are dedicated to learn your rhythms so that they can make you more and more addicted to what they're doing. Even they are beginning to wake up to the danger of this. I've never had this happen, but I have friends. If, if you're vegging out on Netflix for hours and just going on and on and on, there's finally a screen that will, that will come up and ask you, are you still there? Even the phone now will tell you how much time you've been spending on it because we know that we're getting addicted. Now, again, we've got some modern challenges. Of things that are not good or bad, they just have challenges. Now, the answer is for us, as Jesus would say, is to pause often. Is to follow Jesus and pause often. You see, in order for us to do what we're talking about here today, we're going to have to fight for it. it it's not going to become natural because of all the choices we have. Now, I, I would say that if ever we could relate to Jesus, this might be the time because Jesus had to fight for that time. He wasn't competing with the phone. He was competing with multitudes of people that were constantly pressing on him. And often Jesus, like we said, would withdraw. He even at times made his disciples a little bit ticked off 
Because they'd go, here's all these folks who want to be healed. Here's all these people who need to be taught. And you're going off to be by yourself? You've got to be kidding us. But Jesus knew he had to have that. If ever you see the human side of Jesus, it's in him battling for a long time. What did he do? What did he pause for? Let me give you four examples in Scripture. First of all, for rest. Luke chapter 5. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and praise. That's our, that's our scripture. There's all these people pressing for teaching, for miracles. Can't blame them. But Jesus has to get away because Jesus himself needed rest. I like what John Ortberg said, sleeping can be one of the most spiritual things you can do. And yet, I grew up in a time where we applauded people who, who lived with little sleep. Uh, I even remember hearing preachers say, uh, we would rather um, burn out than rushed out any day. But the truth is, you don't have to do either. And Jesus didn't. Jesus knew that rest, that sleep was important. Now, the medical world has acknowledged this way before the church. I mean, you can do, you just Google the importance of sleep. You need it for learning and memory. People who don't sleep enough don't remember, remember things well. People who don't sleep much gain more weight. When you don't sleep much, it certainly affects your mood. It affects your heart health. It also makes you more vulnerable to every kind of disease even to cancer. You say, okay, buddy, well, that's nice physically, but what, what are you trying to say spiritually? Listen to a quotation from an article I read called Spirituality and Sleep. It is hard to be gentle, patient, and self-controlled when I'm running on empty. In my relationship with God, it seems nearly impossible to discern his guidance, hear and obey his voice, or even pray when I'm fatigued, that it takes all of my energy to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You ever been there? I mean, fatigue does not lead to a good walk with God. I mean, we see it in little children. I mean, like I said, I'm keeping my my grandchildren uh, over the last week, some of them, and like my my six-year-old grandson, Taze, you can know a distinct difference in his behavior the next day as to whether he got the, 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 um, the, the right amount of sleep. One hour can make that difference. It's not just children. If you're a 23-year-old man, you're going to be more vulnerable to temptation through sexual immorality or even pornography with less rest than being rested. If you're a 35-year-old mother, you will probably be harsher with your children than if when you had not got enough rest. Or, or you're 59 and, you know, you're tempted when you're tired to, to be rude to your wife. You see, this idea of rest is not just simply about you and I finding a great place to have a quiet time. It's about living like Jesus. And the, the fruit of the Spirit is going to be hard for you to display when you're fatigued and tired. So Jesus withdrew for rest. He also withdrew for recovery. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Now, this is a very painful time in Jesus' life. John the Baptist is his cousin. He's been close to him from birth. John the Baptist is in prison. He's going to be put to death in a cruel way. And Jesus is is hurting. And and Jesus didn't do what many of us would do. He just barreled through the pain. He withdrew because he needed his soul to be healed from the loss. When you're discouraged, one of the best things to do is to withdraw. When you're disappointed in life or even yourself or someone else, it's best to withdraw. When you've been going through endless demands of life, You don't just withdraw to heal your body. You withdraw also to heal your souls. 
You see, alone time gives us a space for our souls to heal. And then Jesus, third, he also withdrew for renewal. Jesus, John chapter 6, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, this is a crazy time. Jesus is at the height of his popularity. This is the miracle worker. This is the greatest teacher they've ever heard. Certainly, he deserves to be king. And they're coming by force to make him become king. And Jesus instantly withdraws. Now, this is my personal opinion. I think the number one temptation that our Lord had on this earth was to take the shortcut to become king. It's the temptation that Satan laid before him when he's in the wilderness. It was the temptation that Simon Peter laid before him when he rebuked Jesus for saying he was in die on the cross. And it's the temptation here in John chapter 6 when the multitude say, let us just go ahead and crown you. You don't have to become king by going through death. You can become king by popularity. And Jesus knew he was tempted, I believe. I know some of us struggle to even use that word with Jesus, but the Scripture says Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are. And I think his number one temptation, makes sense to me, would be to avoid the cross and make it to be king. You see, he needed that time of renewal. He needed that time to renew his vision. Why has he come to this earth? Not to be an earthly king. He knew his vision. He put it succinctly in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus knew to keep his mission and vision clear, he needed to withdraw. And for us, here's what happens in my life. If I just keep myself constantly busy, my life becomes just a task list. And I'll be honest with you, I sort of get a high off marking things off my day timer. No, that's old-fashioned. But if I'm not careful, it, it just becomes a list of tasks that I need to achieve by the end of the day and end of the week. And I lose why God put me here. I lose the broader vision. I forget the why. I forget the big picture. And so one thing withdrawing does is it allows you to renew and to remember why, you're, why you are living in the first place and the vision and mission God has put you on. And then there's one more. Jesus withdrew for, for revelation, for God to reveal his will. Look at Luke chapter 6. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. You'll notice before every big decision, Jesus withdrew. Here's one of the biggest decisions he would make on this earth. Who's he going to leave his kingdom to? Who's he going to give the keys to the kingdom? These apostles. And so before he chooses them, he doesn't just trust his gut level feeling. He withdraws to hear the voice of God. And Jesus understood what we must understand, that to hear God's voice, you must create space and silence. It's hard for God to get through when my schedule is so packed. It's hard for me to hear the voice of God when there's constant noise around me. Jesus understood this. John Ortberg also said this, solitude is the one place we can gain freedom from the forces of life that will otherwise relentless, relentlessly mold us. You see, guys, we've got, we've got so many forces around us that are trying to mold us into being something different than what God has created you to be. And, and the only way to escape that is to get away from all those messages and all the media and all the people even at times to be alone with God. Jesus needed to be able to separate the voice of the multitude from the voice of God 
so he could hear the voice of God. He had to separate himself from them so God could come through. Now, wow, if Jesus needed that, I need that. So do you see those four reasons that Jesus paused? I mean, just look at them for a second with me. He paused to rest and to recover and to be renewed in his vision and to hear the voice of God. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this message, if ever we see the human side of Jesus, that he needed the same things that we need physically, emotionally, and spiritually, we see it in this message. And again, we, we've said this a thousand times, but, but if, if Jesus needed this to stay on track, how in the world can we think we don't? You see, friends, we can either follow Jesus in this pattern or we can pay a steep price. You see, I don't think God's calling us just to put life on pause and just, just be goof-offs the rest of our life and do nothing. But what he is calling us to do is to create a rhythm in our life where pause is included. If not, we don't perform very well. You know, college students, tests say you would be much better off to go take that test and not pull that all-nighter. You lose something when you're walking into that test. You know, your studies would say to all of us that, you know, just pushing and pushing and pushing doesn't make you more productive. In the long run, will make you less productive. It reminds me of the law of gravity. I could be bold enough, arrogant enough to say that I will break the law of gravity. Try it. Go jump off a mountain. Try to fly on your own. You will never break the law of gravity. Here's the sad truth. The law of gravity will break you. And when it comes to what we're learning today, you can try to break all the rules. You can say, I don't need as much sleep as other people. You can say, I don't need these breaks. I don't need these pauses. I don't need Sabbaths in my life. But in the long run, it's going to break you. So here's our challenge, is that we pause by choice. As you're writing down those lessons, as, you're, as we're, we're beginning to come out of the pause, I and mean, we, we see it. You notice that traffic on the road is back to where it was. You see all those pictures from Memorial Day weekend? I mean, even, you know, churches are reopening, and we'll be one of those churches very soon. I mean, things are beginning to come out of this back into at least some sense of normalcy, and it hopefully can continue to evolve in that way. But here's what I don't want to forget. I don't want forget to forget what I've learned. I, I don't want to forget the, what taking a break means. I mean, I, I'll tell you this. I've been less stressed. I've been less anxious. I have... I've actually slept better, and I, I've never had a good history of sleep in my life. And, and so what I want to do from this is I want to build in some time of daily pause and weekly pause. And I want to challenge you to work on this yourself and start building those into your life. Those need to be the non-negotiables. You see, in, in my history, these are the things that I often, when I get in a hurry, say, I don't have time for that break. I don't have time to take a Sabbath this week. And our challenge is to learn from what we've been through and to put it into practice. Often, that's where we started today. Jesus withdrew often. And so, was, so must we. So please take this to heart. I love the catchphrase we use at the beginning. Boredom leads to brilliance. I'd never put those two words together. But after studying the life of Jesus and just the research that surrounds this, there's no question that's a part of modern life that we're losing and we're paying a price. So, let Jesus give you an excuse to take breaks, to build in pauses, to have sabbaticals, to take vacations. Oh, work hard but rest well.
I know for some of this, this is a bigger challenge than to others. I know my temptation is going to be to go back to normal. I know I need prayers. You may need prayers about this. Let's pray about this right now. Oh, Father, Lord, you're teaching us so much. I pray that all of us are living in a way uh, that's open to what you're trying to say to us. I I know for some people this has been a really easy time. For some, it's been difficult. For some, their schedule's been turned completely upside down. For some, their schedule's been actually become more busy. Lord, I pray for all of us that we are learning that life does not always stay the same, that our life and our schedules can be totally interrupted at any time, and that the most important thing we have is our relationship with you, our connection with you, and that we will learn from this almost forced pause to choose the pause, to follow the footsteps of your son Jesus. That's who we claim to follow. That's who we want to be like. But we're not going to be like him without this. Father, I confess for myself and probably lots of other people that I'm tempted as things are picking back up just to go back to my normal schedule. God, protect us. Help us to get specific. Help us to get concrete about these plans. And Lord, God, help us to take pauses by choice so we can be more like Jesus. I pray in his name, amen. We're about to close our service today. And um, I want us to close with a song, Great Things. One of the things I've heard the most comments about as we've been doing virtual services is the virtual worship team that our people worked so hard. And they, they did it on this song, Great Things. This song says, God, you have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. And I want to say to you confidently that I believe that God is doing great things through this pause. And I believe he's preparing us to come out of this more focused on our mission, more thankful for everything we have, more in love with God and more in love with each other. And I think he'll do even greater things. So this will be the final thing in our service today. I pray you'll listen, participate with this great song. And let's dream together about how God does and will do great things in our life. God bless you. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen, you will do great things, God you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have 
Jesus, our Savior, 